Hi all and welcome to Brick by Brick, the podcast for the property development industry. My name is Ian Humphreys and I'm a co-founder of Brickflow and one of your hosts. Each week we'll be speaking to experts and stakeholders from across the property development sector. We'll share ideas and advice on how to get ahead of the game as a developer, as well as trends and insights from across the sector. The series is designed for all experience levels, whether you're just starting out on your property development journey or you're an industry veteran, we'll handpick topics with universal appeal so we can all continue to learn. We'd also love you to share the podcast with your development industry network. Our mission through Brickflow and the podcast is to make development finance better. Every year, somewhere between a third and a half of all SME property developers cite lack of finance as the main reason they don't build more. It's only through raising awareness of the problems that developers face that we will improve. The more people will hear this, the more the industry will pay attention and the better it will become for all of us. So please share as far and wide as you can. We also really want you to join the conversation. If you have any suggestions for future topics or guests or thoughts on any of the podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. Get in touch through LinkedIn or Facebook or email us at podcast at brickflow.com. I hope you enjoy the show. This week, I'm delighted to welcome brothers Paul Davis and Simon Davis from Nimbus Maps. Nimbus Maps is a software service designed to help anyone that wants to invest in property by giving them access to reams of data that, that will help them in their investment decisions. If you haven't seen it, I will let the guys explain a bit more about how it works. But I would highly recommend it to anyone. And in fact, we do mention it on pretty much every person we have a, a demo with on Brickflow. Anyway, let's find out a bit more about them. So welcome to the show, Paul and Simon. Thanks very much for having us on. No problem. Good to see you guys. And um, what we'd like to start with is, is for you guys to introduce yourselves and to tell us a bit more about your background, your careers to date, um, and more importantly, what it attracted you to the property sector in the first place. Why do you love what you do? Do you love what you do? Paul? Yeah, so um, how do we get here? It's kind of interesting, really. So we started off um, life as property investors. Um, and our model back then was all about high-yielding assets. So it's kind of buying some reasonably tatty kind of stuff, getting a nice high yield out of it, putting a bit of debt in place and, and getting a bit of arbitrage between the, the yield coming in and the interest costs we were paying out fundamentally. Yeah. And that was all fine. Work, work, work stream for us. Um, except that, of course, with that kind of high-yielding stock, the challenge you have is that if, if you don't knock it down, it falls down when it hits the end of its useful life. And so we sort of migrated from property investors into kind of forced property developers fundamentally as we kind of tried to, some of these assets that we had that were kind of sweating this yield out of started to, started to fall apart a little bit. And what kind of things did you have? So we had all sorts from um, little local shopping centres right through to kind of big old industrial estates. had a 1930s industrial estate in, in, um, on the Warwick Road in Birmingham that was kind of, very much sort of falling down, your roof was leaking and this sort of stuff, the old northern lights and this sort of thing, you know. And so, so it was really kind of having to reposition those and, and sort of having to, in effect, they, they would have fallen down if we, hadn't, um, if we hadn't knocked them down fundamentally. So we moved into, um, into development. And as we sort of did that, we had sort of a number of key assets that um, we had interest in from different occupiers and this sort of stuff. And one of those was a, um, a, a little retail parade that we had that we had interest in from, from Sainsbury's with a very small, um, a small unit on it that we couldn't fit them in. So we sort of wrote to neighbouring owners and we, we found a pub company, which, was, which punched taverns at the time, um, that we could fit this requirement onto because we couldn't fit it onto our own site. And there's kind of reasons why they couldn't do it on their own and cut us out and this sort of stuff. So we, we sort of embarked on this journey as, as development consultants and we supported those kind of big pub companies and some big PLCs and this sort of stuff in, in trying to reposition their assets, doing the same stuff we'd be doing for ourselves fundamentally. And what was kind of interesting is that as we continued on that journey, we, we got sort of pushed all around the UK. It was kind of, you know, nationwide portfolios. Here's 5,000 pubs. Go tell us what the opportunity is in that. Right, right. We, we found that stuff through data and sort of technology and sort of trying to sweat down what local knowledge is and kind of gut feel. What is that? And how can we approximate it and how could we kind of use that across the um across the industry and and what we managed to do was was to create a way of doing this um using data using technology which allowed us to kind of compete on the on a perhaps a scale we perhaps shouldn't have been able to given the size of our organization given the the relationships those companies have with much bigger organizations with you know local knowledge track record local offices all that kind of stuff 
and that moves into 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 building software because we we started as part of that journey getting retained by some of the big retailers and all this kind of stuff and and we sort of then moved into trying to align what we were doing with what they were doing to to allow that kind of to to unlock so off the back of that they like we did the the um the companies are acting for into trying to sweat their assets they liked it as well and so we're going to can we use the technology you've got and a lot of people get into property development because of the creative side of it so obviously property it's the security of income people know that there's a very good chance that the assets are going to go up in value over a long term because there's a lack of you know it's more demand than there is supply and stuff but i think changing the buildings the creative side of changing a building or shaping it even if it's just an internal redevelopment or something is it's really quite rewarding, isn't it? When you sort of take your idea and then you put it into the physical world, you put it into the built environment. You go, well, look, we, we did this. And Paul and I often talk about the days of the, that wet plaster smell when you go around a, you know, a, a repurposed building and they've knocked the wall down inside. It's a completely different space. I think that's that's yeah. always in, in your mind. Um, it either that smell of kind of stale cigarette and wet plaster, it either kind of <laughs> from excites the builders, you. Yeah. <laughs> If it excites you, you're naturally born property. If not, then yeah. you're really not. But whenever you go on the site, it was just quite fun, wasn't it? To go and see what's happened, what's progressed. And even in a week or a few days' time, you yeah, say, this, this building, this wall was here. Now it's it's an open space and it's kind of, you know, whatever it might be. And it, Looking it's, at the plans think, before again, I wonder what it's going to feel like when you actually kind of, and then the wall comes down, you go, oh, it's like that, you know. Yeah. I mean, people want to use your buildings, people want to live in your buildings. It's really quite positive that sort of get that sort of buzz around that this was your idea. This is the sort of physical work. And I think, to be fair, software development, although it's got its challenges, is very, very similar because you're kind of yeah. you're building stuff that people want to use. You're building data, you're building uh, uh, opportunities for, for people to sort of improve what they're trying to do, achieve their goals and stuff. And I think, um, although we love building buildings, I think building the software is actually equally rewarding because you're actually helping people achieve their goals, which is really super positive when they're with their developers or with their sort of um, agents trying to get a more more leads for their clients and stuff like that. So I think, um, you know, lots think, of developers think, have got challenges out there. And if we can help them and achieve their, what they're trying to do, then it's really very positive and very rewarding in that respect. So Totally. And I think you've got to kind of play to your strengths. You know? So, so you know, are we the best developer in the world? Probably not. Are we the best at brokering, the best dealer in the world? Probably not. What we are quite good at is, is understanding how data sets can approximate these things and can really yeah. kind of focus you in on opportunities and really drive value out of sites, understanding how all that fits together and, and what this data set linked with that data set over there actually kind of really means and how you can leverage that and how you can then give your customers that sort of cutting edge advantage really. And I suppose if we know that's the case, that's where we should focus our attention, obviously. Yeah. We've often been asked about, you know, why do you just keep it for yourself and not sort of pass it to the outside world? But we took, took the view that actually we could create a greater impact sort of socially economically by doing that rather than just keeping it into a sort of software solution that was just for ourselves and we took that that decision didn't we sort of help help the wider industry so yeah no i think we're similarly minded you know we the software we've created is 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 the same like it we we could use it for ourselves but we actually want to share it with a wider audience because we do think it it holds much more benefit to when, when used by a wider audience. Yeah. But okay, so on on what you guys have just said, I mean, the, the two things I took from that were really sort of vision and, and execution, really, both in the, in the physical um, buildings and, and also in the software. So um, visionaries, is that fair enough, uh, Monica, <laughs> for you both? Innovators, visionaries, yeah, quite. Yeah. Uh, Tinkerers and two things like that. Ask the dev team if we come in like, okay, well, I've got a new idea today and how about we do this? And uh, so we pull them from pillar to post. But uh, It's not a bad thing to have on the gravestone. No. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're only a visionary if you're right, aren't you? So you've got to... <laughs> yeah. you've got to You've got to kind of think it up. You've then got to make it happen. And then and then you're a visionary once you've made it happen, aren't you, really? So um, it's all in the execution. Yeah. We have uh, 101 ideas that we think are brilliant. Um, some of them are, some of them aren't. <laughs> Lots of them aren't. <laughs> um, and uh, busy. you're only visionary where it's right. So, um, yeah. so we, we keep, you know, keep working harder, don't we? It's a good job is we're brothers. We can hold each other to account a bit more as well. I yeah, think. Yeah, Perhaps the others we can't. So, uh, one of his yeah. ideas rather than mine. So. Yeah. <laughs> Probably say that be a bit more honest with each other than yeah. a regular business partner as well. Yeah, they're true trello balls. Paul's ideas and Simon's ideas and all the rubbish ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so thanks for that, guys. I, I mean, for, for someone that hasn't seen Nimbus before, 
I mean, in a, in a, in a minute, how, how, how would you explain it? So I guess what it does is it's, um, it's, it encapsulates all the stuff that we learn in that sort of that development consultancy piece. It, in effect, it, there's a sort of a more efficient way that allows you to compete on a big, on a big stage that you wouldn't be able to compete otherwise. And, and, the, and in effect, that's the efficiency. It's kind of the scale and the volume you can get from a, um, the, from, from that kind of a, approach with technology. And so in effect, we, we do that by bringing a lot of information together that is all put to your fingertips where you can search and filter it and find stuff that really is exactly what you want. And then what it then does is it allows you to assess whether the sites work. So you find stuff, you assess whether they work, gives you a load of ways of, of kind of accessing the, the, the industry's black book. So you can kind of connect with owners really quickly. And then you can check as you're trying to put stuff forward, you can kind of benchmark that and make sure you're transforming that asset into the, the most valuable use that it could be. So you're getting every last penny out of it in, in essence. That's really kind of it in a nutshell. Right. And so an analysis, um, appraisal, um, connect, connecting people as well absolutely um, yeah. yeah it's that kind of whole whole life cycle really of finding stuff checking that it works what you want to do with it connecting with the owners and then and then maximizing the, the output of it fundamentally perfect and um i mean in terms of like user numbers i mean what what do you what how many people do you have on the platform we've, have we just broken fifty thousand now sign something like yeah, that yeah so yeah i mean it's, it's it's remarkable that we've actually across all of our products you know about fifty thousand people use it at different varying degrees and stuff but um it depends whether they're really in their, their circle cycle of investment development to sort of some fairly well-known, you know, developers, investors that have been in it a long, long time. So, um, so yeah. That's amazing. And a compliment to you guys that, that people like that also um, want to use it. And that you've got a, a, fr a sort of free version and then you also scale up, right? So more yeah. functionality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's kind of one of those things, you know, it's like, I think, there's lots of free data out there. There's lots of free stuff that the government's releasing. And actually, we wanted to support that as well because that the free stuff the government's releasing is quite hard to deal with. It's quite hard to get your head yeah, around. Yeah. So actually, we've created something where you can you can use some of those data sets and kind of get some some understanding of this stuff kind of for free. It's kind of, it, it's there and hence the, um, hence why we did that. Great. And um, what, I mean, obviously we understand now a bit about how, how it works and what it does, but you talked before about how you got started, that it was actually really an extension of what you were doing already. But mm. I mean, to go from what you were doing to, to sort of software development, um, I mean, that's quite a, quite a change in, uh, in, in tact. Like what, you know, what prompted it? Whose idea was it? Well, it was my idea, of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it kind of um, it kind of grew organically, as as we sort of said. But what um, I think really opened our eyes is we did all this work for for the pub industry, and they were basically selling a lot of their sites to developers quite cheap. And then the developer five minutes later was putting on a you know block of fifty it. flats and stuff yeah. like that, and flipping it. And they were going, "Hang on a minute, you know, we're losing yeah, money here." And we sort of became more of a a gamekeeper than a you know traditional poacher and stuff like that but it was just part of that um word that our eyes got opened up to um a lot of the big corporates so a lot of the big retailers had whole sort of uh planning teams not planning for you know built environment but um location planning teams and some of them had like 60 70 people in this and they were doing an enormous amount of work on predicting what takings might be in a certain location and they were using this sort of data but what we found, I mean, that that in itself, I think, was was a, a real surprise that they were sort of putting so much effort into sort of data analytics about down to what they thought that site was going to take per week and, and the variance analysis around that. But it it, it sort of it just sort of uh, opened up our eyes to um, what you could do. But the challenge was that they were still very in terms of the property side of it. They'd find out what the location they should be, yeah. but it probably just in a postcode or a region and stuff like that, and then. It, shoved it across to the property teams, then go and find me sites that meet this criteria, and then they go back and appraise it. And there was nothing linking the sort of granular property level to the site analysis or the location analysis that the, the guys were doing. So right. we thought, hang on a minute, we'll try and link the two together. And in effect, we did that with the landowner's sites. And we, we had a, a, I think one of our original YouTube videos was talking about a dating website for property, because it's the same kind of principles. You've got these people what the sites and these people own the sites kind of thing we were trying to link the data sets together but there was nothing out there so they were firing up to their acquisitions team of 15 strong they were doing the traditional very manual process of driving the streets seeing what's on available and stuff like that 
because the location planning team was fairly burgeoning of about 60 people telling where they should be, but they couldn't then find the sites. So we sort of thought, well, we'll build this, well, we'll, we'll attempt to build this thing that links the, the physical environment with the sort of the, the data environment. And that's how we kind of got into, into, that, into that journey really with it. And um, as an example, we had one, one client on the acquisition trail was looking to, um, to, to do some work on 8,000 sites that they were interested in buying. And I think the original plan, they were comparing uh, basically getting a, a team of students. I think one of them was going to use his son, who was an 18 year old, to go and like measure 8,000 sites for the whole summer holiday and stuff like that. And said, well, we think we can do this with data and technology. And I think in about probably less than a week, Paul, wasn't it, just to be able to do this appraisal for them and say, out of those 8,000 sites, this right. really work for you compared to probably three or four months of a, a team of, you know, students out of a level and stuff like that. And I think that really showed people the true power of what you could do through data and technology versus putting it. And did you, did you surprise yourself in these early days with... Yeah, I mean, it's cool, isn't it? It's like you kind of someone sends you a list of 6,000 pub names and you've got to go and tell them how big they are. It's like, well, yeah. we just start, you know, text I mean, recognition. 8, 000, yeah, exactly. I think we just had the pub name, didn't we? There was a pub name and there's 8,000 right. sites. And we thought, how do we find out, you know... To, with the hand stuff. it's just really interesting kind of really interesting problems that we're sort of throwing at us really so um it was yeah it's really cool isn't it and that, we love that kind of you know kind of we get thrown a question that is just really difficult you know the, the, the short answer is no we can't it's like <laughs> that's not acceptable we've got to, we've got to yeah. fix that so you sort of you, you think of some kind of cool ways of doing it and before you know it there's your answer and yeah but part of that journey was also to throw those problems at the university wasn't it and we we thought we'd sponsor some phds and we could see the value of it so we basically moved into their science part so we could get links to the university and said yeah, right, we've, we've been, you know, because they're all about the R and D and then trying to find real world, you know, solutions for the R and D and stuff like that. So it's sort of end to end, the latest data science techniques and real world problems. You know, if we could be the sort of bridge between that, and I think we were sort of quite fascinated uh, about what they could do, and we, they were quite fascinated about how this could impact the the real world. So we sort of sponsored some PhDs. We still sponsor a PhD and, and things like that, and work a lot with the university that you know have MSc projects and stuff constantly running in the background to try and improve improve the data and the quality of what we're offering um the outside world so and uh, how does it work with uh, the two of you who who's sort of responsible for what day to day who's the data geek if he review data geek i'm, I'm a geek yeah I'm yeah. A geek. yeah the data and the uh, kind of the and what the data sets mean and how they inter interlink and what that means and how we can leverage that to help and all that sort of stuff that's I think it's fair to say something is me, isn't it, really? Yeah, but, yeah, I think that's... The, but then somebody's got to translate that through to the business, to the outside world, and sort of make a... You know, <laughs> Always got to build a business on the back of that. And that's yeah, got a bit of business. And, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Talk to people about it. And, uh, keep people up to speed. But, yeah, it's... Um, I think it's fascinating. It really is. I think the sort of world's changing. I think that's more so like the lockdown, isn't it? How people have adapted. I think that's the, the human... You know, race is very adaptable, isn't it? To sort of things when, when needs must. And I think that's what's happening now with technology and stuff, isn't it? Massively. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, how have you guys found it during during lockdown? Like, what what impact has that had on your business and your users? You know, how, how what, you know, give us some ideas of of what's changed. It's been really interesting for us, actually. It's been, um, I think, as lockdown hits, there was kind of everyone had a kind of a worrying moment of, oh goodness, that what's what's coming. Um, what's happened for us really well for us is that it's meant that. People have a little more time, they're at their desk, they're prepared to listen. We've done some really interesting webinar series where we've we've brought lots of people together and we've had some really interesting insights off the back of that. Um, the marketplace settled down actually very quickly for us. And I think people saw being online as being really important. You know, we're at home, we're in front of our computers, we're online. Um, and so, so being a productivity tool in that, in that time has been obviously a positive thing for us. Um, it's like retail's gone online, hasn't it, massively over the lockdown period for like yeah. Amazon and stuff like that. But I mean, people are realising that searching and analysing property can actually be an online activity more than the traditional, which is going out and seeing the buildings and, and doing that sort of stuff. And um, so, Have you seen the spike in numbers? Massively, yeah. I mean, we had, I think last week we had a 28% growth in revenue of a new business. So it's gone wow. up in a week. So we've got some... So today we just had uh, five new people start, actually. So we're building the team incredibly rapidly because of the number right, of right. people coming on board yeah. and, and the rest of it. So what we don't want to be is victims of our own success that we can't speak to, you know, give people the demos and can't speak to them and stuff like that because the, the user numbers have gone up, you know, exponentially in a very short period of time, which is great. But we want to make sure you can 
service those customers as, at the same level we've always wanted to service them. So, um, yeah, so the social distancing re-engagement with the office to try and uh, onboard five people to, to sort of build them up and understand the platform and the, what's going on to get them on, on the phones helping people on the chat stuff and that sort of thing. So, yeah, been very lucky in terms of that that growth not, over the last few weeks. Probably not quite as many as, as Zoom in terms of no. new numbers, <laughs> but, but pretty good. Yeah. yeah, it's a similar sort of thing, isn't it? It's kind of a, it's that sort of online kind of business when you've got um, people in lockdown. It's a very positive thing, isn't it, really? It's kind of, um, yeah, it challenges how you help, isn't it? And, um, and providing that support at scale and things like that, really. So. I think that the users, also, the customers are finding that people will engage with them as well. So I think a lot of our, you know, SME developers have historically struggled to necessarily, you know, get people to engage with them, talk to them and stuff like that. Well, People in lockdown will take that phone call now, or the agent acting for that person will take that phone call. If a letter goes in, you know, the post is still working. They, they've got the time to actually consider some of this stuff. So I think, you know, from their point of view, that activity is is growing because people are prepared to talk and listen and, you know, have a conversation about those opportunities that perhaps they were too busy to before, but they've got the time now. So as long as they're not homeschooling the rest of it, which is a, <laughs> always a chat. Well, it's generally, if because of the length of lockdown, I think um, certainly I was speaking to one of our sort of bigger clients um, last week, and what they were saying is that as they went into lockdown, um, there was a huge amount of communication. So they're kind of an international company. They've got loads of offices all over the world and this sort of stuff. And so you've got, you know, your little team that's kind of communicating with you. You've got the kind of the office that's communicating. The office sits part of the of the UK that's communicating. The, the, you know, the, the international ones kind of communicating as well. So you have all this kind of this communication coming at you at the same time. And actually, if you turn at the end of the first week, does working from home in lockdown work? They'd all have gone, no, it doesn't. It's kind of, it's just too much. But of course, because it's three months in now, all of that's yeah. settled down. They've, you know, they've got their right, you know, the right kind of sequence of, of, of the kind of the meetings and the webinars and this sort of stuff internally. Yeah. Now it's all settled down. The kind of the, the world has sort of moved because it's long enough and they couldn't just say, well, actually a week in, we're going to sack this off and, and do something different. It's, so I think it's actually kind of very interesting now, kind of how does, how does the marketplace come out of lockdown and, and what does it take with it and what stuff does it like when it's sort of been through that? Because it's starting to settle in a little bit now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I deco that as well. I mean, we trying to speak to people pre-lockdown and give them demos was, was a challenge, whereas now... People are all ears, they're, they're at home, you know, they're, they're happy to listen, they've got more time. And I think exactly what you guys are saying is, is that, you know, I think it's been a massive learn for everyone, right? I think it would have been a brave bank or law firm that would have told any of their staff to, you know, just we're going to work at home full time mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, whereas now I think because it's been forced on people, it's, it's actually a reality that, that yeah. people can imagine. And in some cases, people want, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, some people I speak to aren't in a massive hurry to go back to work. But I think yeah. what's really good is, is, as you guys touched on, is, is that you've actually demonstrated proof of concept that you don't need to go and perhaps to some of the older guard, that you don't need to go and see that property to get a really good feel for it. And in fact, yeah. in some cases, it might be better to run, you know, the, the analysis remotely so you don't yeah. get you know, emotionally attached to it or anything like that is purely on the numbers. I mm -hmm. think that that's very valuable. Well, what they say about lockdown, the biggest winner is the environment. And it's the same. We've been trying to push this. It's like, don't, don't just go and drive the streets up and down and stuff like that. I mean, one of our early users for one of the retailers said he saved about 15,000 miles a year <laughs> out of 45,000 historically by finding the site, shortlisting them, and then going to have a look at them rather than traditionally yeah. just driving up and down and see if there's a to-let board or a sale board. And, you know, but how can you tell the size of a plot of land from the pavement if it's boarded up or if there's you know it's yeah, almost yeah, impossible yeah. so i think um changing those habits i think generally will stop I mean, how many meetings are people going to drive to when they could do it through a, a you know a, a web chat yeah. and stuff like that i mean it's yeah. um well, i think similar for us as well because what what we tended to find how people use the software is let's say they've got 10 sites and um in the past, they might have gone to see all 10 of them, a bit like you said, Simon, whereas now they run all 10 through the software and realise actually only two of them probably work in, yeah. from a financing point of view. So then they're the two they go and see yeah. um, rather than the other eight that just don't work. So it is, yeah. it, I think you're right. It's the, it's helping the, the environment as a by, byproduct, but yeah. I think really it's just saving people time, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, and giving them that. 
I think you also touched on that, um, the really big point in there, which is that if you spend too much time on a property, you get emotionally attached to it. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you don't want to lose it. And even when the numbers start moving away, yeah. I always think a good site to buy is the one where it all kind of converges and you kind of come to the point of exchange and it's all kind of, it's all come together. And sometimes you find those sites kind of just diverge apart. You suddenly find there's this, there's this bit of whatever in the ground or there's this bit of asbestos that's a nightmare or there's something I didn't know about, some knotweed at the back or there's something, you know. And then two or three of those things all kind of come together and that's when you go, whoa, hang on a minute. But if you've done a load of work on that, you're like, well... I've invested four months of my life in this, yeah. You know, I'll perhaps just chip the price a bit and it's like you try and force it and that's then when it goes wrong. And that's kind of where you sort of, you, you can't help yourself but do it. And it's kind of, that's when you shouldn't be doing it. That's when you start losing money. Well, that's what they always say, isn't it? With developers, they make their profit on the on the purchase, on the land yeah. purchase. All right, make money, yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, that all makes sense. Okay, guys, so um, what would be good, I'd, I'd come back to coronavirus in a bit, um, but um, in terms of long, longer-term impacts of that. But just as some examples of, of people who use your technology, the benefits they get, you know, how, how they engage with it, um, you know the value adds. I mean, we've talked about value add as a as a proposition, but you know, perhaps yeah. some specific examples. Yeah, yeah. So I guess kind of the so as we said, sort of where it all started was that kind of aligning what we were doing with what those big companies were doing, those kind of the retailers and all those kind of things, and and looking how do you find bits of land for infill residential and all this kind of stuff. You know, that was kind of typically the user case. So we have a, a whole host of companies doing exactly that. So we have um, from those big retailer days, we have an awful lot of, of retailers that use the platform. You know, after an acre plus of space or whatever it is, or point to an acre to, to an acre or whatever, sort of picking out those sites and using all of those. And we have you know whole teams of people in all these different companies doing all of this. Um, through to a whole bunch of, of companies that are perhaps have the biggest states. So I like that pub example. I've got a biggest state of assets, and I kind of need to understand what all those assets are. There's too many of them for me to kind of understand myself. So I kind of have to go and research each time. So having somewhere central where I can understand that, see who owns a bit behind it, track the planning applications that are going on and affect what I'm doing, all that kind of stuff. We have a whole lot of people doing that too. And then right way through to um, the SME developers, whether that's residential or commercial, you know, understanding um, whether they're getting the right deal, whether they're getting the right, the right rent out of occupiers, whether they're getting the right terms, you know, lots of, lots of that that sort of time we spent advising those pub companies and kind of the other companies we were working for was around knowing the terms that that particular retailer would take. So yeah. A single, you know, a lease to a retailer could be 7% or it could be 6% depending on the terms that you agree. Yeah. So actually there's a 20, 30% difference in the value of those two buildings, same building, same, could even the same rent fundamentally, but actually mm-hmm. those terms of around what they what they try to negotiate out of it in their best interest letting those owners understand all of that and getting the, the right terms in their leases can make it a huge difference to those, those exit values fundamentally. And so it's doing all of that sort of same, that sort of stuff right the way down then to, you know, how do I find a, a back garden, side garden, infill plot for, you know, buy a house with a gap, you know, with a side garden and put a, put a house in there, sell the house off, or refurbish the house, sell it off, um, put another one in the side and, and then sell that one for this bill and that, all that kind of stuff. So we have kind of a whole spectrum of users doing all of those different things um, on the platform in reality. I think um, um, it's fair to say most SME developers, certainly those who've been doing it a little while, know what they're looking for and what, what their business model is, whether it's, you know, infill plots or it's repurposing, you know, retail units to using the upper floors, which are undervalued and stuff like that and converting to HMOs or residential and stuff. But I think the, the, the thing that they, the challenge for the moment or historically has been is finding enough of new sites and a consistent pipeline it's the same old challenge isn't it? i want to i'm completing what i'm currently working on but i need to build my pipeline for my next project because i'm only as good as my next my last project kind of thing so they, it's always a challenge for them to build that consistent um pipeline and stuff like that but they do know so often that means that um they probably know their local area very well they've probably got relationships with their local agents incredibly well and stuff like that but if they, they've got a proven model of you know retail or infill plots then they might just have to move outside their yeah their, their, their patch a little bit and of course as soon as you start moving outside your patch your confidence goes down in terms of the residential values am i buying in the right location compared to because you know, we all know that residential values can vary by street to street especially somewhere like in london you get one side of the street and you know five times the rent you know the value of the, of the other side of the street so mm-hmm. 
am I getting in the right location? Who's doing what? What's the pay prices paying for stuff? What's the price for land? And what's the even the local planning authorities can have different attitudes towards you know um, different Article Four directives, and that they have different interpretations of of legislation. So they've got to prove a proven model. They may have to move outside their patch, but building those relationships with that local authority or with those agents outside the patch can be incredibly time consuming, if almost impossible sometimes. So ultimately what we're trying to do is give them, you know, a transparent sort of open data set uh, so that they can say what they want to do and move around different locations with confidence to be able to turn around and go, yes, I can go and do that up the road or, you know, into that different county. Cause I know I can see the planning, I see what they're going to say. I know what they're going to say about, my ideas i know what the residential values and stuff like that so it just allows them to have a broader spectrum of which they can go and build that pipeline so they can maintain it um you know most people will travel at least a you know an hour an hour and a half to go and build a project out because they've got their teams and stuff but you know so if we can give them that diversity of, of information they can go beyond their, their patch and they don't have to rely on just waiting for stuff to to appear in a, in a local area that they're familiar with and i think that's that's the challenge a lot of our SME developers have got is they want just a nice continuous pipeline of projects, not trying to buy it super cheap. They're not trying to get a super deal. I think they just want a consistent pipeline yeah. of projects that they can do and they turn their money over and they do the next one. They need to turn the money over for tax reasons and the rest of it. So that's what they're, you know, what, what major part of what Nimbus is about. So you're, you're giving them that basically that ability to sort of cookie cutter you can you've got a model you know it works in this area go to a similar town or a similar city look for similar projects you, you know you know that's going to work so yeah. okay yeah. fantastic and then access to off market and then kind of you know that's kind of part of the trick is is kind of different ways in which you can connect with those owners build that credibility with them really quickly sort of depending on who you're going to there's kind of different ways in which you can kind of build that credibility talk about some of the stuff they've been up to um demonstrate your knowledge demonstrate your ability to deliver stuff it's kind of making sure that you can kind of piece all that together but of course that can be a life's work if you try and do that in a patch that's an hour's drive from where you are from yeah. where you are now then when you get to that kind of half an hour away you know very little about those areas so you have to spend all this time trying to put it all together but actually a lot of the stuff there a lot of the, the, the sort of the history and the track it's just knowing where to go and pull it out from and and how to pack that up and how to present that to people and and that's kind of what nimbus does I and mean, that's kind of that's my bit of this it's kind of understanding which of these key bits of information you link together to then give you something really interesting for for the person you're speaking to so how can you kind of capture that engagement how can you capture that that person to want to talk to you or kind of answer your phone call when you ring up the office line and say well i want to speak to x if you even know who x is you know how do you get them to engage with you well it's all yeah. in the data it's all there the information's all there just to to pull out of you just got to know where to look and then sort of present that to them and you get straight through and, and you're in so um simple as that <laughs> yeah nice. simple as that yeah. <laughs> very easy well, well, that's why it's taken six years so <laughs> <laughs> okay so that's good to know um you know the the scope of the tech and practical applications um and the benefits that it brings to users i mean you you touched on it paul the um the, the lease information, the, the ability to know what a retailer or tenant is going to ask for or what covenants they, they will bend on and what they won't, I think is hugely valuable. I was actually speaking to, to one of our users the other day who um, is doing commercial and uppers and, he's talk, and I was talking about the importance of a pre lap in terms of finance. It obviously makes it a lot more attractive. And um, and, that, and I put him in touch um, with one of the guys in the team to, to do a demo because I just said that, you know, especially in the current climate with, you know, you can imagine if you are in in that retail space, the the, the blue chip tenants really are, you know, able to to ride Rothschild over, yeah. over, land, over landlord, sorry. So I can imagine knowing, you know, what having that little inside information on what they might be willing to spend on is it's hugely valuable at this this time and that can have a material impact on the values obviously you know you know in terms Absolutely. of those, those terms and the leases and stuff like that we, yeah. we built a whole load of convenience stores. we literally built 100 convenience stores something like that and some of the key things around those kind of small format you know the sainsbury's locals the tesco's expressive that sort of stuff those small little convenience shops you go to to sort of top up with and there are a few tricks within those that obviously over the course of building 100 you kind of learn all those tricks 
And some of that stuff was around, you know, do you get a parent company guarantee? Do you get caught with CPI rather than RPI uplifts? Do you get upward and downward rent reviews rather than upward only with a with a, a link to RPI and that sort of stuff? And all of that just flows straight through to your bottom line. And if you know that occupier will take, will accept those things, then you make sure you get the high, you know, you get the lowest yield, the highest price for the um for the building for, you know. And if you if you know they'll accept it, especially in today's market, where if you if you push too hard, they'll go to the, the building next door because that's on the yeah. market as well. Yeah. If you yeah. ask for the right stuff, knowing full well, you can say, yes, yes, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And you don't ask for stuff you're never going to get away with, then happy days, thanks. Yeah, it's knowing which buttons to press. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So how, you know, talking about coronavirus, you know, how how's it affected the markets that your users are in? I mean, we touched on it just then, but, you know, in, in more, you know, expansive terms. Yeah, totally. So I think kind of what's what we're seeing is that there's obviously pressure on companies, obviously pressure on um, companies that haven't been open for a while or perhaps working at a, a sort of a, a percentage of their of their maximum capacity. And, and what we're finding then is those those kind of commercial buildings to convert either you know to some other use that's kind of higher value are getting very hot. So things like you know office those office PD rights, the office Twitter developments that people are kind of keen on. There's, and there's some interesting, interesting questions generally around the, you know, the retail sector, the pub sector. Obviously, you know, those pub companies haven't sold a haven't sold a, a, a glass of beer for three months, and there's yeah. not a huge amount of, it's not looking particularly promising for them um, for for a while too. So actually, kind of where does that where does that leave them? And actually, some of those opportunities perhaps to unlock some extra value about out of those sites, perhaps they can use to sort of to fill some of the gap of some of the rent they haven't had or the, the, you know, the barriers they haven't sold and this sort of stuff, I think becomes kind of quite interesting, really. Um, I think there's a short term, there's a short term thing and a long term thing. Is, you know, we were talking earlier about if our new processes are hard coded into us about working from home, being less, you know, maybe going to office just for more creative time and a few meetings and the rest of your working week is, as opposed to working from home two days a week, you may work for the office too, you know, to sort of a, it's just something yeah. to flip over. But what does that mean to the local economies in terms of perhaps people wanting to get out more to get out of the house because they're not necessarily going to an office, they're less traveling. But what about those offices? And so I think there's a longer term, which we obviously don't know where that's going to go. There's a lot of speculation. I think short term, at the moment, the banks, for example, I think are holding back. They've got giving lots of people, you know, repayment holidays. Tenants are getting a lot of, you know, uh, support on the government and things like that. So at the moment, there's nobody's under any tearing great pressure are they to be forced to sell stuff there's no there's no sort of you know anybody pushing them or anything like that um so i think but i think that will perhaps start to change in the you know, there's a in big the new... lag there's definitely a big lag this time around yeah because there's lots of protections for the tenants there's protections for the landlords there's a sort of you know a bit of mexican standard you know you look at these um construction sites that have basically been mothballed for, for three months. So is it force majeure? I mean, what the contract said is the contractor, the main contractor going to pay for these uh, liquidation assessed damages? Is it the uh, developer's going to pay for them? Or is it going to be a gentleman's agreement? It's going to be down the middle. Where are they going to yeah. get the money from? Is the bank going to lend them more money than the original project? Mm -hmm. Or is the yeah. contractor, the contractors live off cash flow? So who's actually ultimately going to pay for these things when they get it back on site? So I think there's a lot to... You know, this idea of turning the key in the economy is going to start going again, but there's going to be some activity or some changes. But I think activity, the property industry, the one thing is it's an incredibly entrepreneurial industry and they will find solutions for what's in front of them. And I think if that's then changing buildings from where there's a demand as opposed to where there's currently demand, they'll do that. And it just it creates activity. I think change creates that activity. So I think we're seeing a lot more those entrepreneurial people trying to build a pipeline of of projects to start in conversations with people because if the world does change, which is yeah. likely to, they're in the in the box seat ready to, to to have a go and start working with people. I think that's that's what we're really seeing in our entrepreneurial database. It's kind of interesting, you know, because as, as that sort of you know what are the values, what's happening with the banks, all this sort of stuff. We've we've just um, developed something literally has gone live over the weekend, which is looking at you know, companies that are that are kind of in selling mode. So as that kind of pressure comes on. You can you can well imagine the position where companies start saying, "Well, do you know what? If I sell a couple of buildings over here, two or three or something, then actually that can re repurchase my balance sheet. Maybe I do a, um, a sale and lease back or something, you know, so I can kind of retain the asset, but I get some capital, which kind of then fills this hole that 
that COVID-19 has put into my balance sheet. We've just launched a little, um, little bit of functionality in our filters where you can now search just for, for, for properties owned by those companies that have, have just started selling things. And so you can, you can sort of start to get that, that understanding of, well, actually, if these companies have been selling, then maybe there's a few more they might want to sell as well. And, sure. and it kind of starts to piece those, those things together just as that, as that sort of marketplace is changing, really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think the, the government, um, just uh, as an aside, I think they've been really good in, in terms of setting the right tone between, right. Um, you know, with lenders and, and um, you know, the relationship between tenants and landlords. I think that's mm. been really important. But yeah. I think it, there's definitely a lot of pain in the, um, in the pipeline. And, yeah. and, you know, it's probably going to be quite a long time until it all comes out. Um, I mean, on, on our side, the development finance, we found that most lenders have, have kind of automatically granted a three-month term extension. Mm-hmm. As, you, as you touched on, Simon, there's not always the capacity within the original um, plan to actually allow for that extension. So then, you know, there is that cost of who, who meets that, as you say. Um, I think as long as, you know, the GDVs sort of stay somewhere close to normal um, or current then then they're okay but i think where some of the the, the sort of schemes will come unstuck is if there's a big element of, of commercial yeah. um you know unless there was pre-lets or pre-sales in place then you might find that that space is is quite difficult especially retail right. um if you had an element of retail in in your in your makeup but yeah. i mean but longer term like what, what do you see i mean what what's the data telling you on the platform like what are you now how a search behavior changed um you know what where do you think it's going to go? Uh, yeah, we've seen sort of big spikes in our in our numbers. Um, so that sort of stuff is where we're sort of hearing the um, hearing the interest coming from. So those kind of those conversions, like you're saying, really kind of that commercial space. Where do we where do we find that? Um, using the the data sets within Nimbus to work out well, do those do those kind of conversions work? Um, there's some kind of really interesting things that we're also seeing being used, which is around um, looking at what others are doing with their buildings. And sort of right, yeah. interrogating those planning files. So actually, right, yeah. space here is now converting to student, or it's converting to HMO, or it's converting to Resi, or whatever that might be. And you flag that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm saying, look at the planning file as well, isn't it, Paul? In terms of you know people who perhaps got a planning application, but now haven't got the firepower to go and build it out. So maybe they can yeah. those that with the money, or perhaps you know cash rich or cash richer, or got that track record, can go and take those oven ready projects and deliver them quicker than perhaps other people can you know, and that's kind of that local knowledge you talked about earlier kind of having that access to understand which developers are doing what what are they doing with those buildings if i've got one of those buildings what are they doing with theirs because actually it may well work for mine too who are they what are they paying you know kind of how what are those uses they're converting to and who are the end occupiers for those things so can i then piece that together on my building and understand that that's actually worth more than what i've currently got proposed so so all of that stuff is again it's sort of it's one click within the platform to go and find all of that that just allows you to kind of see how that kind of works and then obviously same with that kind of you know been looking at the terms and that kind of stuff it it's all sort of a single kind of click away really so i think all of that's all of the melting pot as you kind of look at your estate and you say well actually how do i reposition this which bits are struggling which bits are going well um I think I've had some, some interesting feedback from some some clients where they're sort of saying, well, you know, a lot of the, the big retailers are saying, well, I'll tell you what, can I have three months rent holiday, please? Can I have six months rent holiday? And I think a lot of the, the knee-jerk reaction is, no, you can't, you know. But actually, some of the companies then are also saying, well, actually, I'll tell you what, well, if you're trading well, and if you've got a viable business that's going to be here after this kind of lockdown comes that comes back, then I'll tell you what, why don't I give you that, that, that sort of that period as rent free but let's talk about an extension of the lease. Let's talk about re-gearing that lease. Let's talk about dropping that five-year break. So actually, I can see my capital values pushing up because of that. And I'll give you what you yeah. want if you give me what I want. And yeah. actually, seeing quite a lot of, it's a very different question then for those occupiers to, you know, if the, if the occupier is trading well and they've got a, a stable business, they know it's going to trade really well once we're back, back out of lockdown, which isn't very far from perhaps we've started trading already now, then committing to a slightly longer lease, which then gives the landlord a bit more, a bit more kind of, you know, um, comfort. Yeah. They yeah. just, they just throw in that vague, that, that void period they're going to have anyway if you decide you want to leave into into that new lease and so and it's a very different conversation then rather than saying can I just have some some free some free rent thanks very much or you know some free occupation which I'm not using I'm not using the building into I'll tell you what let's let's broker something that works for both parties and then you get what you want so you then haven't got that that expensive rent over that six month period um, 
that you've taken a longer lease of a building you want to trade from anyway and that's working for you. And it might be might tie in with your other other point where you were saying that you know if they're looking to to get rid of some assets, um, if you know you've got two that are you know comparable and it's marginal which one you let go, that that sort of act of kindness, as it were, might be the difference between them keeping your asset and and yeah. um, and, and going elsewhere. Yeah, and in reality, you know that, that act of kindness act of kindness is kind of. You know, if you've got a six percent yield in the building, it's three percent worth of value. If I if I get that that lease correct, I put one percent yield. I add twenty percent to the value of the building, so I'm giving yeah, it three yeah, percent, yeah. making twenty. It's like, well, that's very kind, that Ian. Yeah, I think the, I think it comes back to the relationship with the landlord and tenants are changing as well. Though I think that's a bigger discussion. It's you know, the buildings as a service kind of thing rather than just as a you know here's a fifteen year lease, and it's quite a draconian sort of uh, legislation, isn't it? And it's like you're. The tenants have always been very subservient to the landlord, but now yeah. I think it, it's the balance is coming certainly right back, and the leases are getting shorter, more flexibility, and you know it's it's well, there's more choice, isn't there as yeah. well? You know, it's easy, it's easier to move, especially as we talked about, you know, with technology. You, yeah. you know, it's easier to to pick up a business that's been in the same building for ten years than it, than it's ever been. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, you, you have got to. Um, I think you're right. That balance of power is definitely shifting. We did a webinar um, last week about HMOs, and, and the person we hosted on on the on the webinar was was talking about their approach to HMOs, which is putting the the tenant first. So it's designing the building around what the tenant wants and designing everything with that customer first. And of yeah. course, in the property industry, we don't think of that. We think of I'm going to put a 10 year FRI lease in place. To the best covenant I can for as long as I can at high as rent I possibly can. Yeah. It's going to be a shell, and they're going to have to reinstate that shell at the end of it, and they're going to hit them with you know massive dilapidations and stuff Absolutely. like that. Whereas if you then say, well, every other company across the UK puts the any successful company puts the customer first and works out what does that customer truly, truly want, and then builds a whole business around that customer. In the properties, we don't do that. Yeah. It's, but it's it's just starting to happen. So it's absolutely right as an industry we should be doing that. It's just there's there's a way to go yet, but it's. I think it's really interesting times as that as that change happens. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. It's, it's kind of any industry you look at globally um, that there, there, there has been that customer centric approach for quite a while. Mm. Um, like Amazon, yeah, any anything like that is built purely around that the the customer centre. And, and you're absolutely right. I think you you know property's never done that, but. It's starting to. It's almost like the the leisure the leisure sector did it, um, yeah. and and then sort of the others are, are having to um, to take notice now. You know, when we started, there was a number of big companies out there. They said their their approach when they buy a new site, their approach is try to get the tenant not to pay the rent, and as soon as the tenant's not paid the rent, send the bailiff in and tell them who's boss. And that is not putting the customer first. You can see why it's the case. You know, it's like, make sure you pay your rent on time. You've got a 10-year lease, but make sure you pay your rent on time. So put the bailiff in, make sure they realise they can't afford to be, be late, send them an, you know, an interest calculation based on how late the rent is. But that's not putting the customer first. It's smashing the not customer. Not one's choice. Not one's choice, which is what exactly. they're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a mobility. Really choice change. of mobility is, going, is creating this sort of rebalance of power, isn't it? Yeah. But I guess I guess the the sort of rent on rent models that you're seeing, like WeWork, etc. I mean, you you you're starting to see that that is achievable, right? Because they have gone to that extra level of service and flexibility that people will pay for. Okay. Um, so yeah, just more intense management of your assets actually leads to a, leads to a better outcome for everyone, I guess. Yeah. Totally. Okay, so what next for you guys? What 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 the next few years hold for you for nimbus you know how do you see your product evolving like what where, where next yeah so we we kind of we display about a tenth of the data sets that we've got so in nimbus when you log into it there's about a tenth of it's being displayed and and the other nine tenths we're working very hard with and playing with and, and getting our head around and, and using it for um sort of some of these site finding services we do we have the kind of bespoke work that we do in the sort of the in the background that kind of supports people so i think you'll see as we kind of do more and more of that, I think you'll see more and more of those kind of things that we unearth, those kind of things that we learn moving back into the platform and, and just getting stronger and stronger fundamentally around that kind of key, you know, finding sites, assessing what they work, connecting with owners and then maximizing the, um, the, the value from them. Um, we've also got sort of four or five other products that, that we think are really, really helpful and, and kind of sort of help our customers and and sort of the, the industry more widely i think you'll see us you'll see us bringing out it's um um 
a question of, of when rather than if. Um, so I think over the next you know, few years, you'll sort of see, you'll see that happening in the UK. And, and then we have got a few discussions sort of talking about overseas and, and taking the same technology. And you, know, you can scroll out on, Zoom, on Google Maps and scroll in um, overseas while Nimbus could also follow that. So we've sort of got, the, um, got a, sort of a few discussions going on with that at the moment too. So kind of, we've got a busy few years ahead of us, it seems. So. Mm. Great. And then, and then what about the wider prop tech industry? Where, where do you see that going? You know, what, what are the developments? What are the things that you're seeing at the moment which excite you? You know, where do you think there's still gaps to innovate? You know, what, what? Well, I think, I mean, fundamentally, I think data is getting more useful, more trustworthy in effect, and more accessible to more of an SME developers. I think historically um, it was... I guess what we said at the outset was more for the preserve of the big corporates, but with you know the likes of what we're doing, others are, are, are making that more democratizing that data for want of a better phrase, so that more and more people can access it, more and more people can can do it. I think gov.uk, the government bodies are they, they recognize this, they understand this. Not only are they releasing more data to the likes of us and the wider with the wider world, but they're also actually now starting to work on how do we link the data sets and stuff like that. So we've been spending a huge amount of time linking it, making it as useful as it possibly can, whether it's our bespoke work or in the platform. And that linkages is, you know, one bit of data from this data set linked to that one actually then suddenly uncovers enormous opportunity. Um, so I think the government, to their credit, are doing that um, and seeing that sort of um, greater accessibility of, of data is going to create more activity, which means people can build more houses or people can invest and improve redundant buildings, uh, basically put money into local economies or national economies and, and create economic stimulation, wealth, and you know, showing that, that stuff around. Um, I think going forward, it's inevitable as data becomes more standardized, that the likes of, you know, and more transparent, that a, that a ledger kind of system around sort of blockchain, you know, once it's standardized, will find its way into the to the, the property industry. I mean, it's an ideal, you know, industry for, for blockchain to work around about, you know, assessing stuff, acquiring stuff, financing it as well, and, and things like that, having that, that trusted, transparent audit trail. But I feel like, you know, for blockchain to become the backbone of, of the property processes, there's an awful long way to go. And you've got to get the buy-in of the government bodies like the land registry, absolutely number one, the local planning authorities, the local authorities, you know, there's such a diversity of, of information down the different 426 local um, authorities as well. So I think it has to, to come from above, but there is a definite push for that. And I think that will then just create more trust and transparency. And then you'll, you'll probably see, you know, maybe cellular acquisitions of, you know, crowdfunding of properties, more transparency of those blocks and those, and those cells and you can more fluidity of a small amounts of money can go into much bigger deals which creates that greater greater accessibility for people um so i think there's a lot of benefits but you know a lot of it's it's a long old journey that we're all going to have to go on and nothing's going to happen overnight i don't think but. yeah i think like you say the the change has got to be driven from the top and and you know things things don't historically haven't happened that quickly um from from that side so yeah i mean it's, it's on the private sector to innovate and show that it works but then like you say it needs the the buy-in of of a much broader stakeholders i think they have recognized that though. i think the, you know the government and the open you know source data has realized that they're sitting on a lot of economic stimulation more so than they probably need to ever if they give people like ourselves and the you know the, the developer and the well, you know, the entrepreneurial industry access to it they will find ways in which they can find um use of it to create these things because ultimately that's what we're all about you know it's building houses yeah. or building new buildings or changing buildings and putting money into them and uh, and uh, it just creates positivity doesn't it across the board yeah i think what you're seeing is you're sort of seeing certainly from my point of view when i talk to a lot of customers and talk to a lot of people in the industry and i think if you think about where the world was five years ago there were no property companies talking about data data's Data for me is a dirty word. It's it has been a dirty word for you know for the last five years. Um, data is information. Information is knowledge. Knowledge is power. So you almost have to kind of take people on that journey to sort of to understand what data is. But it's been a dirty word, and as soon as you say it, people glaze over and think, "Oh, it's just I just don't understand. I don't want to know." But I think what you're now seeing is you're seeing you're seeing the SME come forward and say, "I now need to take control." Certainly, the bigger the bigger you know the, the medium size and the, and the large companies 
are very clear we have to have a data strategy we need to take control of our data and that's flowing right through the industry is certainly what i see and sort of saying well i need to understand my data i need to acquire data because actually that, that sort of light bulb's gone on the data and information and knowledge we understand the power of knowledge and why we want local knowledge and why that's so important but i think what people haven't necessarily made the connection to is that actually that is actually data and therefore it's now no longer a dirty word and now we need to start harnessing it and i think that's what i've certainly seen over the course of the last few years how that that sort of mind shift has changed and i think that's kind of very exciting for for where that where the industry can now go it can now realize its potential absolutely absolutely okay so um i'd like to ask you both about what you think the biggest challenges uh, that the industry and possibly society face um, with regards to property and land distribution and overcoming housing, the housing shortage. Where, where do you think, I mean, finance is obviously one thing, that's a big thing SMEs um, always talk about, that, you know, lack, lack of appropriate funding, um, which is obviously something we're, we're trying to help with. But planning is, is a big problem still. I mean, where, you know, what else can be done in the private sector to, to aid SMEs and to really benefit society as a whole in terms of addressing the housing shortage? Yeah, so I think um, it's kind of interesting. If you, if you look sort of back 10 years ago, um, the split of new houses that were built between SMEs and, and the big PLCs was about 50-50. And what you see now is that, that ratio has completely changed. And actually, it's about 10% is SME development rather than, rather than the bigger corporates. And I think... You know, if you're if you're a, a, a PLC, you've got your land team. That land team's got a track record. It's got then relationships and agents sort of supplying this these sites into them. And actually, those agents are sort of. I think with that, it's it's relatively easy to sustain those kind of that sort of level of housing that's being delivered. Um, but actually, the SME has got a, the SME market's got this huge untapped potential in it. It's kind of it was comparable, and it's no no longer is. And so I think the SME market is where you really can move that needle and kind of that's, that's about the power of that community. How can, we, how can we support that community to really find the right sites, to know those sites when they found them and work? And kind of our, our own experience of that has been that we're not necessarily assessing sites early enough. You sort of, you go to a site, you get a feel about it, you sort of go, oh, I could fit a couple of semis on there or something like that. And actually, then you find it floods or then you find the buildings listed and actually you you can't get those in for there's some view or whatever it is that kind of, and then you kind of chase the wrong, all that kind of stuff that this sort of pushes the SME into the wrong place. And so I think, I think that that challenge then sort of eases with the likes of stuff like Nimbus, that kind of that sort of being able to, being able to search in areas where those problems aren't there. So you're sort of giving yourself a fighting chance of finding something then that is going to work because you've, you've sort of set the ground, you've set the sort of the, um, the, uh, the, the base up properly for yourself so you know that those things aren't going to come back and sting you so i think that's kind of where where the biggest challenge is is re-engaging and reigniting the sme marketplace giving them com confidence showing them where they can get their stuff from finding plenty of sites the biggest challenge we found as an sme was was the was the supply of sites it was you know you, you're forever trying to look after your agent you're forever trying to trying to encourage that agent to send you that off-market site that they found to you and so actually if you can generate that list that that sort of site that those sites through into your business and you can really drive that scale in then you can choose the stuff that works and you haven't got to chase the wrong one because you've only got one to work on yeah, yeah. I think that's that's how you can really sort of move the needle in the industry is to is to engage that sme marketplace to give them the tools that the big developers have have either got or they're working on a fewer, you know, fewer sites and they sort of do it manually because there's sort of less to do, if you like. And then off the back of that, you're setting them up to succeed because they're picking the right stuff in the right areas where they're going to get get support. Because fundamentally, you know, we've got a housing shortage in the UK. So if you if you take sites forward that are in settlements in sustainable locations for housing that's built in in line with the character of the, of the, of the surrounding area, you will get a planning ticket. It's it's not rocket science. Yeah, you're not, perhaps not they're building down. They, you know, again, it comes back to entrepreneurial nature of the SME marketplace. They can use the existing buildings. They can sort of repurpose buildings. They can sort of take what was upstairs undervalued or underutilized and convert into something else, industrial buildings into other space. So that entrepreneurial nature of the industry is, is brilliant in terms of once you give them the opportunity to sort of work these things out. But plus the fact you can have a pipeline of, of sites. If you've got that dialogue going, 
somebody may not be ready to sell their property now, but they might sell it in two or three years' time. We hear that all the time. Well, if you put a letter across their desk and then in two or three years' time, oh, actually, I've decided to, to, um, to retire now. I'd like to have a, a proper dialogue with you and work with you in terms of, you know, the numbers and the rest of it. And if you can have that, I think, again, if you can have that transparent relationship with a vendor, with the date, and you can back it up with information that this has been sold here, this is what I'm going to go and do, Everybody gets what they want out of it to a decent level. The developer needs a profit, otherwise, you know, it's never going to work. So they've got to get the whole thing to, to stack up. And if you have that open dialogue and you say, we're well, going to build a quality building or we're going to do this, that, and the other with it, then I think the vendors will back that with that, that track record of, of, of trying to make things, you know, happen and, and be a positive environmental change for, for local areas and things. Great. I, I think. Um... You know what, what what we see um is you know i think as as funding gets better you know planning gets better and you know, all of these sort of software um tools you know bringing it all together um i think you will find that that sme sector will grow again and, and will become you know a, a more powerful um deliverer of, of housing and and i think you're right guys i think it needs to um well, I think it's it's also interesting, kind of as you, as you say, because that's one of the other key challenges around that around that sector. Part of it is price and getting the right number of sites and picking the right stuff. But then it's also how far can my money go? And yeah. I'm sort of showing me the thing on Brickflow, which is showing you actually for the same site, same scheme, two different lenders. I could be putting in a fraction of the amount of equity into into one as opposed to the other, which means my money goes twice as far. And yeah. off the back of that, I can then develop more. I can get more sites. If you're buying right at the same time. Then of course we've got all the component parts set up to make money out of these schemes. I'm, I'm making my money go as far as I possibly can because I've got the right the right debt in place and the right the right funding structure. And then of course that's then where that needle can be moved. It's really exciting time. And that comes back to I think this conversation is it's all about we've got a responsibility between our software solutions to ensure that that we can in the background sort of link together so that that SME developer has a relatively clean sort of progress through this this journey and we bring together bring these component parts together so finding them assessing them and funding them it's, it's so vital yeah. isn't it so we have to do the hard yards in the background to to work together as we are to sort of make sure that sme marketplace has the toolkit they need to do things efficiently without burning a load of money and time and abortive work which is ultimately allows them to be more productive doesn't it which creates if, the housing if either, if either falls down along that way then the developer just fundamentally held back if they both work harmoniously together then they can skip forward and that's the that's the trick isn't it yeah yeah no i think um yeah i mean i think if you deliver an end-to-end -end solution where you, know, you can find and fund through um through the same um, tools then you know you really you really are getting somewhere in the space that, that no has been before and and will truly add value um so yeah that's it's, it's something we need to work on guys for sure right um, okay, so we're coming to the end. So just wanted to, to touch on finally, um, what are your hopes and ambitions for Nimbus say the next few years? Like what what, you yeah. know, what what what's your legacy? Our legacy. Well, I suppose you know we want to support our marketplace. That's what that's what gets us out of bed in the morning. It's what it's a, it's that sort of smell of stale cigarette and, and plaster. <laughs> we we love we love that marketplace. We love. The, the repositioning of buildings it's always fascinating to watch a building come out the ground and and sort of see how it's was going to end up in this sort of stuff um i think for us we haven't scratched the surface of what we can do yet um we're you know the, the the data sets and the information that we hold and the and the insights we're, we're driving out of those those data sets is is becoming more and more exciting it's it's kind of it, it's it's really 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 kind of some of the things we can now do that we we kind of hadn't really dreamed of five years ago when we started on this journey and some of the stuff we can now do and it's kind of in a platform you click a button and bang there it is it sort of it sort of blows your mind really and some of those things that we we were kind of so impressed with back in the time we sort of suddenly thought well we could do this and that would give us this amazing result you know picking the right architects or kind of all this kind of stuff that that just, just changes what, what what can be done we really have you start to stretch stuff out. Every time you, you put something together and you do something else, you find something else that can then be can be really kind of really exciting. So I think what you'll find is that really our our hopes and our plans are really just to continue supporting what we're doing and to try and drive as much as much yeah, value. I think out supporting that. that that marketplace, isn't it? I think we want more and more people 
to benefit from property ownership, property investment, property development. We drive a lot of automation through our business to try and keep the cost down so we can, you know, give it to a you know the fair price of that marketplace. So it has a sort of ubiquitous nature. So anybody, you know, it's it's a meritocracy that they can use it and the more people want it. Loads of people want to get into this industry. Loads of people, you know, love it. They want to experience that sort of stuff. And we just there, you know, I think we just got to be there to support them. I think that's what rewards us the most is if we can support them. It's a lot of it's education. We're educating ourselves and what you can do with the new data sets. And then it's then once we've educated ourselves and finding out this thing, it's the sharing. It's, it's, it's yes. a, the world's about sharing these days, isn't it? Um, yes. And, and we, we just want to... Our legacy is hopefully that we we shared and we learned and we're, we're sharing and they can people can more people can prosper at it. That's the the driver for us at the moment. I think that's key as well for us is is um, you know there's plenty of people that are capable of operating in this space, but they just don't have the tools like from either the education um, you know the knowledge to 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 know how to um, use the information that you guys um, uh, get and then you know on the funding side as well. And I think. You know, a lot of builders, I'd say builders, but I mean sort of the, the sort of trade part of the of developer space. Um, you know, most of these guys, the thought of going to speak to a bank or have to, you know, an in-depth conversation with a lender is something they just never want to do. They just want to get on with building. And similarly, I imagine there's, you know, similar uh, apathy to, you know, going and doing lots of research on sites. You know, they just want... They want to know that it works fundamentally. They want to just get on and build it, and they want the funding. Um, and I think if you can, if you can really sort of um, turn those people on that are capable of doing it um, by by sort of giving them the tools, then I think you really could unleash uh, a, a serious momentum. Yeah, um, they're only going to they're buy one site that doesn't work, and they'll realise the value of doing it. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a necessary thing they've got to do, otherwise, because the downstream impact of buying the wrong site that's got a constraint you didn't know about or whatever is it's a wasted journey i mean how many you know what amazon's done to retail if i want this thing i get it on prime i get it delivered in a in a van tomorrow i could go on a journey i could go into the whole of town i could go and run around the whole thing and come back empty-handed so we, which which would you rather do i'd rather click a button and have yeah. it delivered to my front door i mean that's that's the world that we're living in i think property will get closer and closer to that you know and then they can do their bit with what they whatever that asset is or whatever they want to do with that, that property when it comes to their front door. That's that's the world. But, um, well, that's when you start getting um, into modular and, and you know, designing yeah. um, your own spaces and that room by room and stuff, which yeah. is uh, probably a whole other topic we can yeah, yeah. have another day. Um, cool. Okay, guys. Well, thank you both very much for your time. Um, really, really interesting chat to you guys and, and just getting uh, – a good overview of what Nimbus does, obviously, but how that fits into the wider industry and, and prop tech in general. So thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank, thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Brick by Brick, the podcast for the property development industry. It's really interesting to hear Paul and Simon's views on the prop tech industry and the growing importance of data. Both they and I agree that the SME sector is key to solving the UK's housing shortage. PLCs will not be able to do it on their own. Large house builders have whole departments dedicated to finding the right sites and the right finance. If you're an SME, you probably can't afford to employ someone full-time just to find the best site or the best loan each time you're looking at a site. By using PropTech and FinTech platforms like Nimbus and Brickflow, you can outsource those functions, allowing you to punch above your weight. Leverage the tech to your advantage. That's what it's there for. Anyway, we'll be back again soon with another episode alongside other industry insiders sharing their own property journeys, as well as their tips and tricks to help you get ahead in the property development industry. If you've enjoyed this show, we'd really appreciate if you would leave us a review and share the podcast with your property industry peers. And remember to get in touch about this topic or any future topic by emailing us at podcast at brickflow.com. Until next time, take care.